Let's jump right into the theory of it. I'm going to break down some of these uh, some of these chords, and you'll be able to follow along with the voicings that I'm using. I'm not sure if they're the exact voicings that are on the record, but they're pretty close. So let's go. Also, I'm going to do a little singing in this video. I don't consider myself a singer, but I just kind of want to show you where the lyrics kind of line up with the chords, so bear with me uh, as I try to do some high uh, vocals on this one. Here we go. So the D'Angelo version is a D major, but it's a sharp D major. I'm just going to do it in regular 440 tuning. Uh, so let's start. So the first chord is actually the two chord. We're going to come in with an E minor 11. And then we're going to go to the five chord, but we're going to do an A13 sus this time instead of an A7. So if you look here, we have the root, that's A, that's the flat seven there, G, um, the nine is B, there's the sus four, that's D, and then the 13 is F sharp. This also kind of looks like a D major 7 over A. Sometimes you can call it that. I'm going to call it A13 sus, uh, just to keep the, the essence of the 2, 5, 1 here. So following the 5 chord, we're going to go to the 1. We're going to do a D major 9. All right, let's do a quick review. 2, 5, 1. Okay, so how does that fit with the lyrics? Here we go, people. Strolling in the park, watching winter turn to spring. All right, so, yeah, sorry. But uh, let's continue on. So this is where it gets kind of cool, because we're going to go to the non-diatonic chords now. We're going to go to the chords that don't exist within the key of E major, which is the original home key here. We're going to go to a C7. I'm going to play a very basic shell voice in here, meaning just the root in the left hand, and the third and the seven in the right hand. Well, this is the seven here, and this is the third. Uh, so why this chord? Where does this C7 come from? Well, if you're going to analyze it, it would be a flat seven, seven chord. So in the key of D major, you have a C sharp. That's the regular seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, but we're going to do the flat seven. So we're going to lower it down a half step, get to C, and then we call it a flat seven seven chord. That's that last seven at the end there is what makes it a dominant seven. So instead of doing C major seven, we're going to do C dominant seven. So flat seven, B flat. So how does this chord, which is not diatonic, how does it work? How does it fit in with this song? Well, we have to look at some of the chords that come after, so let's keep going. We have the C7, then we're going to go down a half step to B7, and then finally back to the E minor, E minor 9 in this case. Okay, so we have C, B, E. The destination here is important, so let's work backwards. We're going to do a little memento action and go backwards from E minor. Uh, so we have the E minor, that's the 2 chord. We already figured that one out. What came right before that? The B7. B7, a non-diachronic chord in the key of D. doesn't fit. Why? Well, we have D sharp, and D sharp is definitely not the key of D. But this is what's called a secondary dominant. I've talked a lot about secondary dominant chords before. Very good to know. Very uh, important chord function to know. And basically what it means is we're doing the 5 chord of whatever chord follows. In this case, the chord that follows is E minor. So the question is, what is the 5 chord of E minor? And the answer is B7. So that's how we get B7 have that nice resolution here. If we were to do a traditional resolution, it would sound something like this. Now you can see how the D sharp falls down to the E, the flat 7 and A falls down to the G. We have that nice resolution that's the traditional way of resolving the five chords with one chord. Uh, but of course, we're doing some more modern music here. It's a little bit of, uh, of an R&B song, jazzy song, so we don't have to worry so much about all of those counterpoint rules. So we're going to just go from here to E minor 9. We still have some of those resolutions. We still have the A resolving down to the G, and you actually have this D sharp resolving down to the D, which sounds like that. So, now we have to figure out what's going on with that C7. The C7 is very much related to the B7. It's, it's a great passing chord from getting from the 1 to the 6. Because remember, we were on D major 7, and then we went down to the flat 7, and then to the B7. So you hear this transition a lot. D, C, B. The C is actually very similar to that secondary dominant. This is instead, though, a secondary dominant turned into a tricum substitution. Well, what the heck does that mean? Well, if you take a look at the B7 and you figure out, well, what would the 5 chord, what would the secondary dominant chord be going to B7, you have to find the 5 of B. And the answer is F sharp. So an F sharp 7 would resolve really nicely to a B. You hear that, that nice resolution there? A 
okay, but now we also have to do that tritone substitution I was talking about. So we're going to look at the F sharp 7 and go a tritone away. What's a tritone away from F sharp? What's a tritone, by the way? Well, the answer is in the word tri. Tri is three, like tricycle. It's going to be three whole steps. So we're going to go from F sharp to a C7. One, two, three. Those two chords are tritone away. That's where you get the tritone substitution. That's how the passing chord of C7 works so well going to a B. We're going to keep going forward here to the second verse. Well, it's not really the second verse. It's the second half of the first verse, which is basically a repetition of what we just did. So we have from the top, from the very top, E minor 11, A13 sus, D major 9, C7, D7, back to the two chord, E minor 9, a13 sus, and then the one chord. And then again, B7, oh, sorry, C7, B7. Okay, that's when things are going to change, but before we do that, I'm going to do a little vocal uh, action here so you can hear how the lyrics land with the chords. Here we go. Water break. <laughs> Okay, so we're halfway through the chord progression. Now we just have to go to the chorus. So instead of going from Hey everybody, Jeff Schneider here. In today's video, we're going to do a chord analysis of one of my favorite D'Angelo songs. Feel like making love off of the record Voodoo. The song was originally written by Gene McDaniels for Roberta Flack in, I think, 1974. And then, of course, it was covered by D'Angelo. Hey everybody, Jeff Schneider here. In today's video, we're going to do a chord analysis. Welcome to this video picking lesson mark for you. Let's talk about chords. Basic chords and how to transform these basic chords and make them sound cool and a little bit more professional. Okay. Now we're gonna use um, a couple of different things, you know, such as adding extensions to the chord, adding short melody to the chords. So hopefully you're gonna like this lesson and I try to keep things very simple, okay? Because you can get all the tabs you can get each, and you can get these tabs as well as all the YouTube tabs and additional video picking programs. Also, subscribe to the channel if you want to keep up with your coming lessons. Now, let's have a close up and let's get started. Alright, guys, now the chord progression super simple G major, E minor, C major, then B B major chord. Okay? Now, how do we transform the things? The first step is to add extensions to the chords. Okay? 
And what an extension is, it's basically an additional note that we add on top of the basic chord. Now when I play the first chord, the G major chord, it's basically three notes. The G, the root note, the B, the major third, and the D, which is the third and the fifth, right? Now the extension will be an additional note such as the seventh, the ninth, the eleventh, or the thirteenth, right? For the G, I'm going to use a major nine. So, Beautiful sounding chord, okay? And I'll play it like this. We have the little in front of the three, which is the root notes, the D string open, and the G string open on the two, and the B string open. Root note, fifth, major ninth, and the major third, okay? Now the picking pattern is really, really important because you want to make sure that this chord uh, ring out beautifully, okay? So you have six, four, Three, four, six, and two. All right, beautiful sounding chord. Now the second chord is E minor, and I'm going to play a different chord, still basic, but with an extension. So I'm playing an E minor seven. Picking pattern is the same, but it's the same. And I'm playing it like this. So I have low E, open string, G, E, and the D string in front of the two, which is another E. And then I have the, um, sorry, the G is the minor third, and then I have the B string fret number three, which is the note D, the minor seven. The finger picking pattern is the same. So I have six, three, four, six, and two. Now the third chord, C major seven. Beautiful sounding chord. And I'm playing it like this. I have the uh, A string front of the three root notes, the D string front of the two, the major third, and the B string. But the G string open, which is the fifth, and the B string open, which is, which is the major seventh. Okay? Same thing in pattern, okay? I have five, four, three, four, five, two. And then I have the last chord. The chord is a D, beautiful D suspended chord. Okay. It could be a D suspended or it could be a D R11. And I'm playing like this. I have the A string fret number 5, which is the root note, uh, the D string fret number 4, which is the F sharp, the major third, the G string open, which is the 11, okay? And the B string fret number. Now, because we this chord, we're playing the major third, uh, and then we're playing the eleventh. I would consider this chord to be an R eleven chord, um, and rather than be a sus four chord, because usually the sus four is without a major third, without a third. Okay. So because we're playing the third, we call this one a D R eleven. Okay. Beautiful sounding chord. And the figure figure pattern is the same. Five, four, three, four, two. And we kind of let it ring out a little bit more. So we play the same picking pattern, okay? And with a little bit of vibration, I really like to emphasize the last chord. Trying to move you into a little bit more. Right. So this is the very first uh, example, okay, and then there is another thing that we can do which I'm going to show you right now, is adding a short melody to the chord, just check it out. Now guys, you can develop a little bit if you want to uh, kind of, you know, spice things up with a melody, and you can add a melody to the chord, so you can keep the same arpeggio, and then you can add a melody. Find things up and still, you know, keep it in the whole progression for the symbol. Now, the other is the same note, and the melody is on the E string, fret number three, E string, fret number three, okay? Now, the second chord, E minor, same arpeggio, 
expression that a lot of people develop with, which I'm always a bit in debate about whether or not I should put one on my board. But aren't we all constantly doing that about everything? Before we decide when or where we'd like to use compression, we need to understand what it actually does with the sound. Here I've got a recording channel provided by the kind folks from Tegler Audio on here, apart from uh, preamp and EQ, is a brilliant compressor that will help us demonstrate what compression actually does. So let's record some acoustic guitar. And now I'm recording without any compression at all. <laughs> Turn on the compression. All right, brilliant. The bigger the waveform, the bigger the amplitude, the louder. So now we see both waveforms look totally different and they sound different. This is the first one with no compression. So what the compressor is actually doing, it's squashing the sound to get rid of the loud peaks and the transients. A transient is the initial attack of the sound, so a clap has a very loud transient, where um, a hum, the hum has a very weak transient. So we can see the peaks from waveform 1 are way higher than the peaks from waveform 2. If you look at the meter when I'm playing, you see it's moving, and the numbers on here represent the amount of decibels that's taken away from the sound. So from just a tiny bit, let me give an example, to quite a lot. But by playing like this, we're not only getting rid of the peaks, but we're also lowering the overall volume. So let's have a look at the squash peak again. What if we bring up the volume with 60 dB? So now the peaks of this clip are roughly at the same height as the peaks of this clip. But let's have a listen at the difference. So no compression. Compression. Now we brought up the overall volume and it sounds much beefier, more fat, because the ringing part of the chord is brought up by 60 decibels. That's so one more example, but now let's totally turn the compression to 10. <laughs> So now it sounds more controlled, more in balance, but also less changes in volume. So we lowered the peaks in volume and we brought up the quieter parts, squashing it together. And that's basically what the compressor does. But why would you want that? Well, there are many reasons why it would benefit the sound. The guitar is a perfect example of an instrument where the initial attack of the sound, again called a transient, is way louder than the rest of so for the ringing, it's way less loud on the initial attack. Not as much as with drums, for example. But still, the transients are loud. So uh, sometimes you want to tame those peaks a little bit. You're controlling the sound a little more, so you can hear everything the guitar is singing. Hear the quiet parts, and we're not getting blown away by the louder parts. So speaking about understanding, on my vocals right now, it's a fair amount of compression too. Because sometimes I'm moving away a little bit further away from the mic, or getting a little bit closer to the mic, and I want to be running at the same volume. That's why I always do some compression on my voice. That's now about the labeling. All compressors have different labeling. It works slightly different, but the basic idea is always the same. The threshold determines when the compressor actually starts working. If you play a guitar very quietly, the compressor does nothing. Then if you really dig in, it starts reducing the volume of the peaks. And then there's attack. It basically determines how fast the compressor 
starts working when the signal is coming through. So if you want to get rid of the initial part of the guitar, transient, you set the attack to the fast. Let me give you an example. So let the switch to fast. This sounds a little bit flatter then. See that second hit is loud, way louder. Just so compressed with a fast attack. Right, then there's also a release that determines how fast the compressor goes back to zero after being triggered. And last but not least, there's ratio. And the ratio is the amount of reduction it applies to the signal for any given increase in guitar signal. So the louder the guitar, the more gain reduction. A low setting will reduce the volume slightly, whereas a high setting will completely squash that sound. Let me give you an example. So let's have a listen how boring and lifeless this sounds. <laughs> That's not what we want, but that's compression too, so overcompressing. People call this a sausage sometimes because the visual represents a little bit the shape of the sausage. So but how can we use a compressor pedal for the electric guitar? Does it work the same? Well, let's find out. So the workings for an electric guitar are definitely the same, but the uses can vary. A compressor pedal can be used more as an effect too than just a production or a mix technique. So here I've got the Kali 76 and this is the perfect example of a pedal type compressor. So the threshold of this pedal is dialed in with the input volume. So the higher the input, the easier it compresses and the output determines how loud it gets sent to the next pedal. So then there is of course attack and release as we discussed and a ratio. So a common thing you see a compressor pedal used for is when playing a rhythm guitar to make sure we're getting a nice, balanced, smooth output. For example, like this. too much, all life gets sucked out of the sound and this is something you should avoid if it's not an artistic choice. A good solution to this is the blend knob that's incorporated in this pedal. So we can mix the drive signal, so a guitar with no compression at all, with the sound of the compressed signal. So now we've got a super compressed sound, it kills me, but let's dial in some of the original guitar. <laughs> Everything is compressed. I'll dial it into a fifty percent. Parallel compression. So now we're still getting that sweet attack to the guitar, but also the full body compressed signal. There's a lot of pedals that don't have a blend knob, so then you have to 
fiddle around with the attack knob to get some of those transients back. So, but if you really like that super compressed sound, you can use that as an effect by itself. So, you're generating way more sustain that way, bumping the volume of the trill of the guitar sound. Let me just record it so you can see how it does that. <laughs> used to hearing these four chords that it's just so much easier writing a catchy tune these beats. Of course the song is much more than just chords, but if you're playing with just piano, it's really striking to hear. But how does this work? And how do you know what chords sound good together? Well, it's actually super easy, especially if you've been following along with the music theory series I'm doing. There are two ways you can look at it. Theoretical, which we will discuss first, and practical, which I'll show you later in this video on the guitar. And more of my words, it's actually surprisingly easy. So um, remember we look at the major scale in episode 2. Well, thank god we still remember it, because we're gonna need it again. So let's take a look at the C major scale for now. So we've got C, D, Can you write something for me? 
It's not a biography, no. It's a, the major scale of C. Thank you. Cheers. All right. Okay, so it's C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. The major scale of C. And label each note with a number from 1 to 7. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. Less minus 1 or 8 yards. All these four chord songs are played using the 1, the 5, the 6, and the 4. But in music theory, when we talk about chords, we use Roman numerals just to keep a clear distinction between notes and chords. So here we go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 1 again. If you don't understand how Roman numerals work, then remember it's easy in mnemonic. Go to google.com and search how do Roman numerals work. Super easy. So, in the key of C major, the one chord is the C. The five chord is the G. The six chord is the A. And the four chord is the F. Wait, that doesn't quite sound right, does it? No, it does not, because the 6th chord needs to be a minor chord, so the A needs to be an A minor. That's better. But why is the A chord supposed to be minor? Well, these chords sound good together, because all the notes that make up these chords are notes that are found in the key or scale of the C major. So uh, remember, the notes from the scale are C, F, A, B, C. So no sharps and no flats. But if we play an A major chord, this note, fret 2 on the B string, is a C sharp. That's not the note in the scale of C major. C sharp is not C. It's not D. We get C or D on C sharp. So it sounds a little off. It's not diatonic, as we say. To make the sixth chord, the A, diatonic, or fitting to the key of C major, we can't have a sharp note in the chord. So we need to lower the C sharp to the C. And the rest stays the same. C sharp to C. And guess what chord I'm playing now? Well, of course you got it. A minor. So the sixth chord is always a minor chord if you want to play diatonic chords only, which in this moment we want because we need a four chord recipe, which is absolutely 100% diatonic. So let's do it again. The one chord is major, the five chord is major, the sixth chord is minor, and the four chord is major. Minor chord is written as a lowercase Roman numeral. If we take a look at the other chords in the key, we'll find that the 2 and the 3 also need to be minor to be diatonic. And that leads us to the following row of chords. 1 major, 2 minor, 3 minor, 4 major, 5 major, 6 minor, and 7 diminished. Wait, diminished? Yeah, this chord is also minor. But we also need to lower the fifth, making it a diminished triad. Not used that often, it's more to be played as a seventh chord. But anyways, the key of C becomes C major, E minor, E minor, F major, G major, A minor, B diminished, and C these chords sound good together, so there we have our answer. These are seven so-called four degrees from the diatonic major scale, or the harmonized major scale, the major scale like the chords. So the only thing you have to do right now is to rearrange them in such a manner that it sounds good. And apparently the one, five, six, four progression sounds pretty dang good to us. Another one you hear a lot is one, four, six, five. Or just one, four, five.
Samba! Now, the next step is to play the same chords but in a different key. So I just have to grab another scale and you can apply the same things. So the chords, the scale, next to Everything is playing the key in major. So here's the major scale. Have sharp. Have a sharp. A, B, B, C sharp. Another trick is to make the chord progression minor. You can easily do that by using the so-called parallel minor. It's when you start on the 6th chord and go from there. So, in the key of E, that would be C sharp minor. And then you get C sharp minor A, E, B. So. Or in C, that would be A minor, A minor, F, C, G. So, same four chords, but different starting points. There's an easy way to translate this into the guitar if you just look at the fretboard as a diagram. So you can either find the one on the 6th string or on the 5th string. So let's start on string 6, the low E string. Let's play in the key of C, so the 1 chord is on the 8th fret, C. So we play a C major chord. The 5 chord is always one string down, two frets up. So the 1 chord is fret 8 on the low E string, C. The 5 chord is always one string down, two frets up. And the major chord is so G major. always two frets up from the five chord, but then it becomes a minor chord. And the four chord is always two frets below the five chord. Or one string down from the one chord. So it's always the same. Five, six, four. It doesn't matter on what point you start, you can start on any note. Let's start on A. same on the A string. Let's find a random note on the A string. Let's start on C for example. So the one gets the major chord. The five though is just the one string up. Six again, two frets up minor. And the four again, two frets below the five chord. Four. So four, five, six, and one. So in E you can do like this, one, five, six, four. You don't even have to know the names of the chords, you can just play it. Super important, if you ask me. And this is basically just the first step of using chords that sound good together. They don't have to be diatonic, of course. It's never wrong to play chords and tell so, so the next step would be to break up the diatonic chords, mix them up.
George Benson! As I came up, right? uh, I thought if I learned all my skills that I would be able to play music. And no. uh, over a short period of time, I found that not to be the truth. <laughs> so, when I started finding out that music is a language and skills are just the alphabet, you need phrases to actually So, say for instance, we were dealing with, um, uh, let's see major seven, right? Okay, so if you're soloing, you can just go. Doesn't really sound like so. Here's what you actually are hearing on the recording. Somebody plays C major seven. That's when you're people. actually starting to make music. And that's music that affects people because the reason we make music is because we want to feel something. And those three elements is what does it. So if you're going to take our phrases, they're going to be based on that element. Number one, rhythm. If the bass player and the drummer are playing on one, I'm going to play after one. Well, I like this. Not 
playing on one actually pushes it forward. And I'm playing with the rhythm section, not against it. Okay, so when we're dealing with harmony, it can be any kind of harmony. It can be uh, minor, it can be major, it can be dominant seven. Or maybe all of them. I think his F chords are painted on. Here to here. Huh. To here. So my phrase, it has to actually, you, sh you should be able to hear the quality of the frame without actually hearing a person play behind you. So, here's a phrase that's based on major. Now, harmony, again, uses minor. Listen to you all day, bro. The way that classical musicians feel rhythm can be very different from the way that rhythm is felt by musicians who play jazz, rock, or pop music, or really any music from the past hundred years that has its origins in West African rhythms. Professional classical musicians are known for their tone color and their control and their dynamic range, but very often rhythmic facilities in classical musicians can be left a little bit wanting. For example, check out this actual instructional video from this double bass professor who teaches at the University of Washington who talks about the importance of being able to accurately perform chordal triplets. And then he doesn't quite accurately perform them. There are a lot of places here where you have to play three against two. So you have to I think he means clearly. So. Okay, so what's going on here? This guy's been teaching at the University of Washington for 24 years and can't perform this very simple rhythm. What gives? 
Three years ago, I walked into a rehearsal studio to rehearse music for the master's recital of Wim Layson, a Belgian composer and pianist. Wim got together an ensemble with a classical string quartet and a jazz rhythm section, and so we sat down to sight-read a piece of music in 9-8. The basic pulse of this piece of music was 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 1. So it was sort of like 4-4, four, four, but with an added eighth note. So we sight-read through the music pretty decently, but we in the rhythm section train-wrecked when we got to a measure that was accidentally notated like this. In this particular measure, it looks like the unit pulse is actually a group of three eighth notes, or a dotted quarter note, instead of the unit pulse that we were supposed to be feeling, which was a quarter note. This is why when you're writing music in odd time signatures, it's extremely important to get the beating of the eighth notes right, because it shows the unit pulse of what you're supposed to be feeling. Now, we had the rhythm section train wreck when we first came across this, but the classical string musicians kind of just sight read through it with no problem whatsoever. So my initial reaction to this, like most people's reactions are when they're confronted with the virtuosity of a well-trained classical musician, is that these musicians were simply superhumanly good sight readers of a caliber of musicianship far, far higher than mine as a lowly jazz musician. This artifice was shattered quite spectacularly a couple months later when we actually went to record the music as part of our album, Inside Outside. We used the same classical string quartet, and they performed most of the album quite brilliantly, but they had a lot of problem with this particular rhythm. This 16th note syncopation, they could never really quite play cleanly, and so we actually had to fix it in post-production. This confused me. Because I saw these same classical musicians perform these very technical feats of musicianship, and yet this simple rhythm that I and the rest of the rhythm section had no problem with, they could not really play very clearly. Why might that be? One framework to understand this, and this is generalizing a little bit here, is that classical musicians react to the pulse, and jazz, rock, pop, etc. musicians feel the pulse. Classical musicians will very often perform an ensemble under the direction of a conductor, and the conductor's job is to keep everybody in sync not unlike a drummer does. Orchestral musicians will react to the ictus of a conductor's baton or a conductor's breathing, and then they'll count rhythms based upon the pulse that they are seeing. This might give some insight into why Wim's string quartet could sight-read that music that was contrary to the pulse of the rhythm section. For the rhythm section to accurately play these rhythms, we needed to graph the subdivisions onto the actual pulse. It was very difficult to do that when visually the pulses do not align. So the result of all this is classical musicians might have a good sense of rhythm, but not have a good sense of what's called phase locking. Check out these two metronomes, one on my phone and one on my iPad. They're both clicking away at 120 beats per minute, and yet they're not phase locked. The downbeats do not align with one another. A big part of locking into a groove is not only keeping the same tempo, but also phase locking with the other musicians in a particular ensemble. Watch this video of Leonard Bernstein conducting Mahler's Fifth Symphony. No, the video and audio are not out of sync in this one. This is an extreme example where the orchestra and the conductor are not phase locked, but it is a common sort of occurrence in classical ensembles where not everybody is playing perfectly in sync. This actually is not a huge pressing problem for orchestral music, and the reason for this is that the initial attack transients of strings and woodwinds generally are fairly soft. If the initial attacks of each one of the notes are not 100% phase locked, it actually doesn't sound particularly bad. This is very much not the case for any style of music that relies upon drums. Right. The initial attack transient of a drum is very sharp and very short. So if any other instruments or any other drums are out of phase with that initial attack transient of the drums, it sounds kind of bad. It's a rhythmic dissonance known as a flam, and it can be particularly vexing. This rhythmic dissonance is what makes things sound not locked in or not grooving, not together. And it's not as huge a deal with orchestral music because of the softer initial attack transients. Check out these two examples. They both use the exact same MIDI data, which is not 100% bass lock. But in the first example, you have softer attacks and slower attacks. And in the second example, you have much sharper and shorter attacks. Classical musicians might not apply the same rigor to the study of phase locking as other musicians do. That doesn't mean that they have poor rhythm, it just means that rhythm is sort of applied in a slightly different way. In string quartet music, for example, the rhythm sort of ebbs and flows. It's a lot more fluid and goes with the melodic line. Let's check out Maurice Ravel's first string quartet, he actually only wrote one string quartet, in F major.
Is the pulse metronomic? No, of course not. If everything was completely even, it would sound very stilted and unmusical. So the music itself requires this very different understanding of rhythm as a whole, and so the musicians themselves are more apt to apply that understanding. So it's a little unfair to bemoan classical musicians' lack of phase locking because the music itself requires a completely different understanding of rhythm in general. If you want to check out a great string quartet that has a great jazz rhythmic sensibility, check out the Turtle Island String Quartet. This has been Adam Neely. If you've enjoyed this lesson, please comment, uh, please like, please subscribe, do all of those things. I have a new lesson coming out every Monday, so stay tuned. <laughs>
The most noteworthy gag from the minuet and trio second movement is this slapstick horn passage containing these obviously wrong notes. In Mozart's time, the horn had no valves, and besides stop notes, was limited to notes of the harmonic series. <coughs> to partially solve this problem, they used different lengths of interchangeable tubing called crooks to play more easily in different keys. This is why orchestral scores from this era notate the horn parts without a key signature as a transposing instrument in the key of the composition. This slapstick horn passage is thought to simulate what would happen if an ill-prepared horn player mistakenly attached the wrong crook. <laughs> slow third movement is the ending of the violin cadenza when the upward major scales suddenly become a whole tone scale at the very end, followed by this unexpected pizzicato note and this strange trill between two non-adjacent notes. piece occurs in the presto finale that opens with this theme. Part of what makes the theme so amusing and catchy is again the irregular phrasing with the overall theme lasting 10 measures divided into phrases of 4, 4, and 2. with another quirky 10-measure theme from the finale of Haydn's 66th Symphony in B-flat, in this case divided into equal five-measure phrases. Mozart finale now continues with a capricious immediate modulation to a statement of the theme in the flat medium key of A flat major before abruptly jumping back to F major as if to say, never mind. <laughs> to the flat median are not common in Mozart's music. Sounds like two people arguing. One other instance that comes to mind is the non-satirical version of this same modulation, occurring at the beginning of this A major K464 quartet. It starts with the first theme in A major, immediately modulates to a false second theme in the flat median key of C major, and then modulates to the actual second theme in the expected dominant key of E major. Notice the perfection of the four-part imitation in the first modulation, and more importantly, just notice the overall compositional skill that Mozart displays at the height of his non-satirical compositional ability. Remember, this is one of the six quartets he dedicated to Haydn, all of which he said were the fruit of a long and laborious endeavor. Thank you. 
Now comes the much anticipated fugato based on this sophomoric subject. I've been expecting it. This section reminds me of a funny comparison of Handel and J.S. Bach, attributed to Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach, that says, Handel's fugues are good, but he often abandons a voice. Bach's clavier fugues can be set out for as many instruments as they have voices. No voice fails to receive its proper share, and every one is carried through properly. I doubt whether Handel's fugues will ever bear comparison with Bach's. I haven't yet done a video about Handel's music, but I certainly consider him a great composer, and Maybe I don't can't. completely agree with Handel. his assessment. But it is definitely true that his contrapuntal writing is generally more sparse. Returning to Mozart's Fugato, the quote about Handel is a perfect description of the counterpoint seen here. In skillful fugal writing, the contrapuntal lines are as independent as possible, and static moments from one voice are complemented by motion from another. The first countersubject of this Fugato is not really much of anything other than two notes that are completely subordinate and complementary to the subject, and the last of which even doubles the subject. The second countersubject is only slightly more substantial and seems more like a standard baseline accompaniment. Suddenly, these two countersubjects drop out completely and are replaced by this third pitiable countersubject, consisting of just one repeated note and a trill. Notice also that Mozart intentionally commits the harmonic faux pas of doubling the third of the triad, adding to the clumsiness of this passage. <laughs> There seems to be a fundamental disagreement here. You can't play music wrong. Next comes an absurd passage featuring a very long trill marked piano played by Wolfhorn. You're playing music, you're doing it right. As I mentioned before, horns in Mozart's era had no valves, so trills could only be accomplished by moving the jaw, lips, and tongue a difficult technique known as a lip trill. Good horn players were certainly capable of this, which is why there are many trills, for example, in Mozart's common horn picture. But this particular trill imposes the added difficulty of having to play a trill for nine straight measures, almost guaranteeing a clumsy sound. Under the trill, the violins give us the semblance of the indicative counterpoint, but notice that the overlapping portions have the identical meaning that one is basically just the accompaniment of the other. Since the dark blue motif is just a decorated version of the green motif, it also doesn't really add any substance to the counterpoint. This new yellow trill motif combined with the dark blue motif from earlier, now alternates with this new green motif combined with a new pink counter motif that completely lacks any independence or contrapuntal relevance. <laughs> Despite this, Mozart still subjects the pink motif to contrapuntal manipulation, with the pink and green motifs trading places in invertible counterpoint. I'm labeling the green motif Alleluia, because it reminds me of the famous final movement of his K165 motet. Now listen first to the Alleluia theme from the motet, and then compare it with this passage. <laughs> One of my favorite platitudes now occurs when this descending passage played by the violins is immediately repeated verbatim, but this time playing each note twice in a perfect parody it's a lot of, of judgment composer's attempt to create in this variety. Report. The section now ends like, with this silly Like, did the author of this video think, think that this is a comedy piece, or did he read comment. it somewhere? And if he read it somewhere, was the person who stated that it's a comedy piece in fact correct? Who is this based on historical evidence? 
I don't know. And where's the line between making a joke and having fun with some notes? The main theme now returns in the dominant key of C major, leading to another juvenile passage in which the ending portion of the theme enters imitatively, juvenile. followed by imitative entries of its inversion, followed by this red passage that gradually grinds to an almost complete halt before a surprising fourth hit outburst brings us to the F major recap of the main theme. Sounds like a, a lot of call response, like a dialogue with, uh, uh, like a dialogue. Mozart's musical humor was strongly influenced by Haydn, who was the master of humorous musical devices. For example, the silly imitation and inverted imitation from the passage we just heard is remarkably similar to this passage from the finale of Haydn's Opus 33, Number 3 Quartet in C major. <laughs> The red portion that humorously lulled us into a false sense of security and then surprised us with a loud outburst reminds me of a similar passage from the opening movement of Haydn's 60th Symphony in C, nicknamed Il Distratto, or The Absent-Minded Man, because it was originally incidental music for a play with that title. The passage in question is marked perdendosi, meaning losing oneself, and it dies away in a similar manner before the surprising loud outburst. This Haydn symphony also has a moment in its final sixth movement that resembles Mozart's wrong notes from the horn that I discussed earlier. In this case, the energetic crest of finale screeches to a halt and the violins suddenly start to their strings with the score directing the two and the A string from F to G. to Mozart's recapitulation section, noticing this hilarious moment when all the strings suddenly double each other. Also pay attention to the return of the horn. You mean we're playing trill. unison? This is even more Lord. ridiculous because they play two octaves apart at opposite extremes of register. Finally, notice that the green Alleluia motif is combined with the pink counter motif in invertible counterpoint, but this time the pink motif itself is inverted in addition to the inversion of its position in the score. I think this is meant to represent two people arguing, which is exactly what's happening right now.
this section now begins with the main 4-inch scheme that Mozart now treats with a contrapuntal device of its own, known as imitation per parse and pit, which means in this case that the original entry is on the weak beat and the answering entry is on the strong beat. I have an entire video dedicated to this topic, in which I call the technique irregularly metrically shifted pedal. The forums now play the main theme, accompanied only by sparse pizzicato notes from the bass, leading to the final and possibly most famous gag of the entire piece, an early example of polytonality, during which the forums are the only instrument remaining in F major, and each of the remaining parts plays a cadence in a different key. Now listen to the entire quota section of Mozart's Faithful Fool's Day Master. of the grand old operator. Well, he cut, cut off my umbilical and tied me off with his yo-yo string. It was easy going up for me. Music City has always been good to me. Got room for you and your cowboy boots. We'll even get you a rod stone soon. You don't even have to say. Producers with computers can fix it all in Nashville, Tennessee. Sing along in perfect harmony. The world's greatest living guitar pickers can deliver you a pizza or a silky weed. Guitar strings grow shrubs and maple trees. Guitar picks double out of gumbo machines. Happy Bumblebee. The cops carry capos in case you want to change your key in Nashville, Tennessee. Start it with me in the music city. We'll drink all night and write songs, all I will say. Country stars play Japanese guitars. Come and visit me in Nashville, Tennessee. That's it. That's Music Appreciation Hour number three for today. See you next time.